Oh, hi, I'm the heretic. So every day, there's always something to be outraged about. You've seen them, right? Article headlines that just piss you off because the subject matter is just something horrible happening. Then it turns out to be worse than you thought, triggering an emotional reaction as you feel empathy for the victims of this completely unnecessary wrong being inflicted against them. The wrong usually being some injustice being committed against someone, often an abuse of institutional power. But you see that, and you think, this is it. This is rock bottom of the downward spiral our society is circling into the toilet bowl with. You might think that while this won't be the end of things like this, you are powerless to prevent it, and an acceptance is felt. Not acceptance, as in justifying it in your own mind, of course not but acceptance in that future news stories of things like charges dropped against police officer who shot and killed 8-year-old boy armed with military-style semi-automatic assault lollipop don't provoke the emotional reaction in you. I mean, why would they? All they're doing is confirming a bias that was implanted in you by these stories in the first place. In essence, the state of injustice becomes the new normal. But my point is that I've given up on thinking I've seen it all. Because sure enough, the state and the rapidly degenerating culture it actively subsidizes through government schooling and university grants finds yet more ways to offend anyone with even an inkling of concern for objective ethics. I'm sure I'm going to be accused of poisoning the well in regards to the article I'm about to talk about, but if there's another way of interpreting this story, then I haven't found it but let me know in the comments below. Now take a look at this. Mom dresses six-year-old son as girl, threatens dad with losing his son for disagreeing. So here's what's going on. James, at the age of three, was being dressed as a girl by his, for lack of a better term, mother. She insisted on calling him Luna. And now, the mother and father are having a custody dispute. Now it's unclear if the divorce was before or after the <clears throat> mother started doing this. But the result is that now the father, Jeff Younger, is locked in a custody battle with the mother, Anne Gergiolis, who is seeking to completely terminate the father's parental rights, which is even more unfortunate when you consider that the child has been diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Now who diagnosed him, you may ask? Why, the gender transition therapist who was handpicked by the mother. This is important. In fact, it's the fulcrum of this entire dispute. You see, the mother wants to not only prevent the father from ever seeing his son again, but force him to pay for the gender-affirming therapist, medical procedures, and hormone therapy, which the mother wishes to put James on starting at the age of eight. Now, gender dysphoria, in a nutshell, means you feel like you're a sex different than how you were born. The way some people deal with it is through sex reassignment surgery and affiliated procedures. You know, as in what the mother wants to do to her son. Now, this is important because in order to diagnose gender dysphoria, the patient needs to be persistent, consistent, and insistent about being the opposite sex. So far, the only time being the opposite sex has occurred is at the mother's home, where he is enrolled in an all-girls school in the first grade and only allowed to wear girls' clothes. But here's the thing. The cross-dressing would only happen at the mother's house. At the father's house, he dressed, played, and otherwise acted exactly as you expect a young boy to act including play fights with plastic swords and dressing up as a superhero. Now, the burden of proof is always on the active side, not the passive side. So the question of a potentially life-altering medical operation is going to be on the mother to prove that James is persistent, consistent, and insistent on being the opposite sex. If this were true, then there would be no disparity in terms of how James dresses. James's own behavior should be a convincing enough rebuking of the diagnosis, as you will see. When presented with two different sheets of paper, one saying Luna and the other saying James, he picked Luna in the presence of the mother, while picking James in the presence of the father. 
the dad is forbidden by court order to tell his son he's a boy for some reason. So James is given a choice between boys and girls clothes at his house. He not only chooses the boy clothes, but his insistence on them has been described as violent. Eyewitness accounts of James include the following. Based on three occasions I've spent time with him, I'd say he acts and looks unmistakably like a healthy six-year-old boy, Pastor Bill Lovell said. They were both all boy and were having a great time. Both boys were absolutely dressed as boys and behaving as boys, said Ellen Grigsby when talking about James and his brother. Family friend Sarah Scott, whose own children play with James and his brother, said the following in emails. We had the boys over. The boys took turns telling stories, and James made up a story about five little boys, himself, his brother, and my three sons, who were such good friends that they magically turned into pumpkins so they could stay in the pumpkin patch together forever. His mother came to pick up the boys to take them to his brother's soccer game. James hugged his dad and said, love you. He refused to go to the soccer game as a girl with mom and stayed with dad. That evening, they came to our house. This is not the behavior of a child who believes of the opposite sex. And any court that goes along with this mother's demented delusion is unfit to exist. At this point, I've proven that the diagnosis is incorrect and the burden of proof has not been satisfied. And thus, the surgery is unjustifiable. But there's still more going on, as I'm sure you can guess. Anyone paying attention noticed James's desire to conform to whichever parental authority figure happens to be there at the time. It's clear he loves both his parents very much and wants them to be happy. For sure, the divorce has already done horrific damage to his psyche. A child that young is going to see their parents as superheroes, great monoliths of goodness and virtue to be loved and respected. So what percentage of the gender dysphoria comes from the insistence of the mother? I admit, I don't know enough to say for certain that in the times we hear from the father that James isn't simply conforming to him instead. But as I said, as the mother is the active party, the burden of proof is on her. So since only one of them can be correct, we have to assume it's the father. So let's address the elephant in the room. You have a mother attempting to groom her son, her own flesh and blood, into life-altering medical procedures that are absolutely going to destroy his life before it even begins. Doctors who work in the field of behavioral therapy adopt transgender ideologies that make its practitioners go out of their way to diagnose children like this. Six-year-old boys have no concept of sex, and their understanding of the boy-girl dichotomy is pure tribalism and something to do with cooties. For God's sake, he's a little kid. He can't possibly make an informed decision about something like this. How the hell would someone who hasn't even hit puberty yet know about their sexual preference, let alone be able to understand the risks and side effects associated with therapy, including but not limited to sterilization? What's really going on is that James is caught in the crossfire of social justice intersectionalism run amok. Behavioral therapists put kids who raise even the slightest concern about their sex on the fast track to expensive medical operations, even though kids who might think they're trans might think differently later on. Feelings can change, but the physical and psychological damage of life-altering surgeries on a developing hatchling can never be reversed. It's institutionalized child abuse, and those aren't my words. They're the words of Dr. Michelle Cretella. Executive Director of the American College of Pediatricians. In her words, it used to be the goal of the medical and psychiatric profession to help people become healthy. But after decades of political correctness with the sexual and gender identity issue, the happiness of the patient has eroded the goal of health. But happiness is not the same as health. We could make patients with anorexia very happy by putting them on a diet that would help them starve themselves. But we know this is harmful for the patient. The problem is in their minds, not their bodies. The same is true for those who experience gender dysphoria. We need to help them resolve these issues in their minds, not mutilate their bodies and sterilize their reproductive organs. By encouraging young people to do this, we are encouraging large-scale 
institutionalized child abuse. And she's right. Medicine shouldn't be about making people happy. Happiness isn't the doctor's responsibility. And let's be honest here, a sex change operation isn't going to make anyone happier. The only one who is going to be made any happier from James's future involuntary transition is his mother, who gets to pat herself on the back of how progressive of a parent she is. All the while, James will have to live with the knowledge that his mother took advantage of his young, impressionable mind to coerce him into being maimed and mutilated by equally self-righteous doctors. When he's old enough to understand the full extent of what was done to him, how will he feel? Betrayal? Anger? Hatred to the people who stole his childhood? But it's not just the mother. Oh no, you have the behavioral therapist who gave the diagnosis. The school administrators at the girls' school who know full well that Luna is not a girl, but are more than happy to entertain the lady's delusion. The lawyers in divorce court on her case, the judge, the judge's clerks, and the other support staff who are seeing this case. The ones who said that it is completely appropriate to use the power of the state to restrict one American's free speech rights to prevent the father from telling his son about the scientific and religious arguments for the gender binary. There are dozens possibly hundreds of people at multiple levels, both in and out of government, who could put the brakes on this thing but don't. My favorite part about this whole situation, and of course by favorite, I mean I consider this to be the most deplorable aspect, is how the mother isn't wanting to pay for the therapy or future surgery with her money. No, she wants the father, who's fighting like hell to put a stop to this, to pay for this. The father who is only allowed to see the kids a few weekends a month and has a restraining order preventing him from even entering the town the mother lives except to pick up the kids. The father, who's facing horrendous legal fees after being fired from his job after transgender activists called his place of business and got him fired. His life was destroyed by this, this injustice. This lady, who initiated this entire conflict can't even find it in her heart to pay for her son's own mutilation and castration herself. And she's trying to get the state to force him to pay for something he's morally opposed to. I mean, this isn't the first time the state forces people to pay for things they're against or even consider murder. Conservatives are forced to pay for abortion, while liberals are forced to pay for war. And I'm sure you all remember the title of this video. Well, it's not clickbait. Laws are just opinions backed by guns, and in the case of Jeff Younger, father of James Younger, the violence that is U.S. law will aim its guns at him for disagreeing with the hypocrisy of Ann Gerjolis. The opinion being that my son is transgender, and I believe completely, beyond any doubt, that he should be transitioned into a girl, but I don't want to pay for it. Now, some people think the solution is to get the same state that enabled this crime against humanity to be perpetuated to crack down against degeneracy. If that's the case, then the best you can get is a postponement of the problem. Any government structure you conceive of will eventually be turned against you, and once so empowered, what they do is entirely out of your control. And you will have no say in whether or not we do have, as the title of this video says, state mandated degeneracy. Any state powerful enough to ban degeneracy is powerful enough to mandate it. Yes, what is happening to James is absolutely despicable, and the lengths to which this mother has gone to ruin not only his life, but the father's is nothing less than evil. I can also conceive of this being a more common problem than I realize. Dr. Michelle Cretella did indicate that this is a rampant problem, but without the violence of the state backing the mother's opinions and in a society where all associations are voluntary, then this case would never have gotten this far. No voluntary arbitrator could prevent a parent from telling their young boy they're a boy, at least not unless they want to have customers, nor can they force parents to pay for gender reassignments, especially if they haven't committed a crime. Unfortunately, we're not there yet but there are things you can do. Check out savejames.org 
and donate to their Go Get Funding pages. Links in the description. As you might imagine, legal fees are ruining this father's life and he needs our help. Also, sharing this story and getting the word out is a positive thing we can do, as is sending him a note on social media of our support. This goes without saying, but don't go after the mother. I don't want anyone sending any accusations or death threats. I know it's tempting, and trust me, I feel the same way, but we can do a lot more as a positive force for good. Even so, on the website is a PDF with several prayers you can say to the Lord tonight. Please, we don't have to be spectators. I know I'll be following this story for a while, but I also know this isn't the only instance of this happening in the U.S., just the one I happen to know about. Questions? Comments? Critique? How rampant do you think the problem of children being coerced into transgendering is? How soon until the backlash against the transgenderist cult strikes? Leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.